What's up, everyone? Welcome to Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Bron Bafflestone. So today we're having another episode of my deep dive series. Today, looking at the Hex Blood, one of the new lineages introduced in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and a very interesting one. So this will complete my trifecta of the three new lineages. And so without further ado, let's take a look at this really cool new racial option. The Hex Blood. Where wishing fails, ancient magic can offer heart's desire at least for a time. Hexbloods are individuals infused with eldritch magic, fey energy, or mysterious witchcraft. Some will enter into bargains with hags, gain their deepest wishes, but eventually find themselves transformed. These changes evidence a hag's influence. Ears that split in forked points, skin in lurid shades, hair that regrows if cut, and an irremovable living crown. Along with these marks, Hexbloods manifest meh hag-like traits, such as dark vision and a variety of magical methods that beguile the senses and avoid the same. Although many Hexbloods gain their lineage from making a deal with a hag, others reveal their nature as they age, particularly if a hag influenced them early in life or even before their birth. Many Hexbloods turn to lives of adventure, seeking to discover the mysteries of their magic, to forge a connection with their fey natures, or to avoid a hag that obsesses over them. All right, many thanks to my assistant, Adelina, for that lovely description of the flavor text for the Hexblood. And now I want to dive into all of its specific uh, character abilities and the mechanics behind them. Starting with Air of Hags, because this is a role-playing distinction that I do think is worthy of being called out, because Hexbloods are very distinctive looking, right? Their appearance is very weird if you look at the different options and it always includes an unusual crown, which serves as a visible mark. So this is clearly a negative that's intended to be attached, and so we can't just reskin this away. And so that makes it kind of cool that they come with Disguise Self. However, I do want to point out you might want to invest in a Disguise Kit proficiency as well, because that might make a difference depending on what your DM says. He might also say that the crown is just so prominent that we can't conceal it with the Disguise Kit talk to your DM about it, and if so, then, you know, Disguise Kit can be an option, but otherwise the Disguise Self is going to come in handy because of Air of Hags. Next, the stat bumps are cool. You can get the traditional plus two, plus one, or you can spread them out to plus one, plus one, plus one, which can be a pretty awesome option for point buy because that means you can get three 16s to start out, and that can be a pretty solid option for some multi-attribute dependent builds. The Hexblood does get Dark Vision, which is always fantastic. And the Hexblood are an unusual creature type. They're not humanoids, but are considered to be fey. And this comes with several positive effects and negative effects. And I've called out the positive ones in blue and the negative ones in red. So first, they are unaffected by abilities and spells that target humanoids. So they are unaffected by animate dead and create undead, by the indifference of calm emotions, charm, hold, and dominate person, crown of madness, Fast Friends, the Zombie Rider, A Finger of Death, Magic Jar and Soul Cage, the Whisper Bard's Mantle of Whispers and Words of Terror, and Lycanthropy and Vampirism, unless you might want those, in which case you don't want to take a Hexblood because they can't get those. So all of those are positives. On the downside, you can't affect them with the Charm or Fear Suppression of Calm Emotions. They aren't subject to Reincarnate. They can't use Simulacrum, which is a huge negative, because if you normally get Simulacrum, you are always looking forward to getting that. Taking that off the table is really a huge negative for me. And the Warlock Gaze of Two Minds. And then because they are Fey, they are affected by abilities and spells that target Fey. And all of these are bad. You're affected by Dispel or Protection from Evil slash Good. You're affected by Forbiddance, Hollow, Magic Circle, and Temple of the Gods. All of those exclude Fey. You can be subject to Planar Binding. That's obviously not going to come up too often, but man, if it does, it would really suck to be vulnerable to that. You're vulnerable to Divine Word. You can be detected with Detect Evil slash Good and Commune with Nature. You cannot impose Charm on 10th level Land Druids because they have Nature's Ward. You can be turned by Arcana Clerics and Oath of Ancients Paladins. You can be targeted by a ranger with favored enemy or primeval awareness, and you can be targeted by a paladin with divine sense. Now note that some of these things can be mitigated with Nystal's magic aura, 
but that is just way too complex to get into here. I will definitely do a deep dive on this in the future. I've had a few requests for it, and it is a very good spell. So I will get into it in a later video, but I don't have time to go into it here. But generally speaking, the Fey thing comes with some good and some bad to it. So definitely be aware of what you're getting into when you choose the Hexblood in that regard. The Hexblood gets Ancestral Legacy, so if they start out with this lineage, then the two starting skills that they get is really good. But we have to point out that this ability offers the potential to just stack on a fly, climb, or swim speed to the regular Hexblood stuff, and that is totally overpowered if it's the fly speed. A lot of DMs are not going to allow that, but some will, so you can ask if you want, and that's obviously good with any flying race. But you might also consider the lizard folk or the tabaxi because those come with two skills and a swim or a climb speed and your dm might feel comfortable with those even if he's not comfortable with a fly speed so something to consider if you're looking into a hex blood and note that it starts with common and an appropriate language but the dm must approve that second language even if it's a standard language and not an exotic language normally he only has to approve it if it's an exotic language the Hexblood have the option of being small or medium, and either way they get a move speed of 30, and that's great to have the option, and it's great to get both small size and the move 30, unlike a lot of other small PC races. If you're small, you can ride medium sized mounts, and that has synergy with classes that have options like that, such as the Battlesmith or the Beastmaster. Being small means you can definitely fit into a bag of holding. You might be able to do so if you're medium, but the DM might also object if you're medium, saying that you're too big but hard to make that argument when you're small. Being small allows you to take Squat Nimbleness, which is a pretty solid half feat. I've used it in a build before. Gives you that plus one to stat, and then you also get plus five move, acrobatics or athletic skill, and advantage to any of your grapple escape checks. So definitely a place for it in some builds. When you're small, you're one step of size reduction away from being tiny size, which can offer some tactical advantages. For example, riding in the Paladin's backpack, it's a lot easier to find cover when you're small, especially when you're dealing with some character abilities that affect a five foot cube. For example, Minor Illusion or Mold Earth. It's always easier to find cover when you're small. If you're small, you're better able to leverage Tree Stride because that's based on your size and the size of the tree. So the smaller, the better, more trees available. And being small has no effect on your carrying capacity. So that's good. There are some downsides to being small, however. One, you cannot use heavy weapons without a disadvantage penalty. So that's going to let out small size for some builds. Being small also means you're an inferior grappler because then you can only grapple medium sized creatures or smaller. Being small means you can't carry medium sized allies with you with Dimension Door or Thunderstep. Being small hampers you with Disguise Self because you can only add one foot of height to the illusion. So being small is going to let you out from impersonating a lot of races. And finally, when you're small, you can't make a clone. Oddly, you have to be medium in order to make a clone, so that one doesn't really have much effect in terms of gameplay, but man, as a wizard, if like this was real life, I would be really super disappointed to not be able to make a clone, because immortality is kind of like part of the deal, right? Of being all-powerful and immortal. That's why we all get into wizardry, right? <laughs> Next up, the Hexblood get the Eerie Token. Note that the token is magical, so it's affected by Detect Magic and Anti-Magic Field and all of that. And it has a 10-mile range on both effects, so that's pretty solid. Now the telepathic message aspect of it is always on and unlimited use, which is always nice. That always catches my attention, but it's also one way communication only. And that really sucks. That actually makes things very logistically difficult. It's mostly suited for a solo infiltrator or scout role where you're out up ahead and can then report stuff back to the main party. And even then not having the ability to talk back and forth is going to be annoying. Now that said, if you have two hex bloods in the party, then you're good. Then you get that awesome two-way communication. But that's probably not going to happen, right? At least not at most tables. Also, the telepathic message does have the potential to mess with the target's head, because they're getting messages, but they don't necessarily have any idea of where they're coming from. Like if you slip the token onto them with sleight of hand, and then they just start getting all of these messages telepathically, and they have no idea what's going on. It could definitely unnerve certain people. The Eerie Token also offers a remote viewing power, which is a scrying ability that offers interesting spy potential in certain scenarios. You do get both sight and hearing out of it, and so you can get intel on any area into which you can place the token. So you can, for example, put it under a door or through a crack or some such and get intel on the other side, moving it around perhaps with a summon or a mage hand or some such to make it easier. 
or you could even attach it to an arrow and shoot it up to 600 feet away. And once you start the scrying, you have up to a minute. So if the carrier is mobile, then he can see certain, you know, multiple areas, move down corridors, through doors, into the darkness, etc. You can combo the token with an alarm. And then once the alarm triggers, you can then scry the area of effect. And that can be pretty cool. We can combo this with sleight of hand and or telekinetic or mage hand or some such. Slip that token onto somebody and then we can scry them later. Although be aware, it can be problematic in terms of the view, because if we slip it into a pocket or something, then the visual isn't going to be much, just the inside of a pocket. But it's not completely debilitating because we do get the sound as well. However, you only get one use of this. It lasts for one minute and then the token is destroyed. So that's going to be logistically problematic as well. There's no way to really know the optimal time to scry, or at least it's difficult to know. And so it's easy to blow it and then it's destroyed. And then once it's destroyed, it shuts down the telepathic message thing. So use it with discretion. The token is very valuable for the telepathic message thing. If you set it up right, you don't want to destroy it cavalierly. And while the 10 mile range is good for the telepathic message, it's not amazing when it comes to scrying, I think. It's still solid, but it could be better. And then also note that you can combine remote viewing with telepathic message to ask a question and then ask for a response. And then you can hear or view the response through remote viewing. And then for one minute, you can have a conversation with someone on the other side of the token, even though you can normally communicate with them telepathically in only one direction. You can alert them that you're about to activate the remote viewing, and then you can talk and have a conversation basically for one minute. Finally, the Hexblood gets Hex Magic. And this is pretty awesome. You get both Disguise Self and Hex always available and a use each per day. Disguise Self is a fantastic utility spell to always have available especially when you're a Hexblood and you've got that giant crown that you need to hide sometimes. And again, note that medium size can leverage this better than can small size. And Hexblood also get Hex, which is a very strong offensive option for certain builds, including the Warlock, which normally does have access to it, but they have a very limited number of spells known. And so taking this gives them a plus two in spells known. And the plus two are strong options. Because don't forget, Hex can be upcast, and that will greatly extend the duration, and you can bounce the targeting of it around. So this actually offers some really good durability on particularly grindy days when you've just been exhausting all of your resources. This is something that you can just keep up all day long, but does get overshadowed by better spells as you progress. So it's not one that you always want to keep for a rainy day, and having it always available is nice in my opinion. I think the ideal build for a Hexblood is going to want to have a few more available spell slots so that you can use Hex consistently and not just the once per day. But you also don't necessarily want to be such a good spellcaster that Hex gets replaced by a superior concentration spell. So I think it's very interesting for half casters and one third casters and marshals with a caster dip. So that's it. That's my take on the Hexblood and my deep dive into its abilities. Something I'm definitely going to take into consideration as I build my Hexblood character in the days to come. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you think I missed anything and that there's other cool ways to leverage these Hexblood abilities. Regardless, thank you so much for watching. This has been Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Bronze Bapplestone. I had the help of my lovely assistant today, Adelina. See you next time.